I'm not a happy rapper. Hey, this guy's putting words together. I don't care what I'm supposed to say. My music is not for children. Welcome to Europe. Can you say a few words in Swedish? Better do, stand me, stand me. Come on, you can do better than that. Stand me, stand me. Better do, stand me, stand me. The box pop, scars it out. Can you say something else? Ring of cross. Isn't that like hard for you to just like talk in everyday life? And it's goodbye for me and Eminem. I'm not a happy rapper. You know what I'm saying? I'm not, I'm not. It's just not me. I like. I'm, I'm fascinated with with gore and things like that, you know what I'm saying, in my imagination. about his mom he's got a he's got a lot to go on Eminem you know needed Slim Shady because cats in Detroit just they just love that negative shit man they, this guy's demented I was like that was wow it's turns out we think about some stuff like that you have to have some kind of screws loose and I'm familiar with his relationship uh, his kind of love-hate relationship with his his uh, then girlfriend a lot of his angry lyrics were around her you know, she'd do something to piss him off and write a song in Eminem's case, he created that character as an outlet for, you know, uh, sort of the angst that he was feeling. It's like Marshall Mathers may not turn around and, and tell you to piss off, but Slim Shady would. I, you know, I find them all amusing on one level or another. You know? And when I say amusing, I mean entertaining and funny and dark and, uh, you know, thought-provoking, definitely. Naturally, everyone points to 97 Bonnie and Clyde as, you know, it, was, it just blew everybody away, the idea that, that he would put together something like this and put it on a record. And he made no apologies for it. And he doesn't apologize for any of this stuff. I mean, I remember the time that, uh, that he called me up and he, he read, uh, I mean, he rapped over the phone, um, just the two of us, or Bonnie and Clyde, as, it, as it's now called. Um, and uh, that was certainly the most, caught me the most off guard, you know, the whole story. He's definitely got this anger inside of him that he has to get out on his records. I mean, the sicker the shit, the more controversy you get, the more record sales you get, you know? I, I love the mushroom song. <laughs> I didn't mean to give you mushrooms, girl. Because it, these are linear tales. They're going somewhere. You start out and you listen and you, you're going through a hole. He's telling you a story like Slick Rick used to do. And that's real important because cats don't have concepts in their rhymes anymore. They just rap about the dope and the drugs and all that. And it's tired. And when you come with concepts and stories, it'll keep somebody interested. Like if you hear a tape and all the songs is like that, you can listen to the first verse of every song and just skip to the next song. But then when you hear the first verse and you want to hear what happened in the second verse, you know, so you're going to keep listening. It keeps you tied into the music like that. He's a real gifted cat, very versatile. You know, the whole idea of rap is to be king of the mountain and me and my boys are going to kick your ass. And he doesn't need 
the boys. He doesn't need a posse. He doesn't need any of that stuff. He's not interested. For him, it's just, you know, this is me. I'm, I'm a freak. I'm insecure. I'm mentally ill. I'm suicidal. Uh, and uh, it, it seems to work for him. And, and people are just so glad to hear something different. And he's, he's remarkable, really. balls that it took to write something like that and just the, the really throwing care to the wind, you know what I mean? It was, uh, it was definitely some unique stuff that nobody would ever wrote a, to a concept like that. You know, there's been lots of concept songs, you know, um, I Used to Love Her by Common, um, Lottie Dottie by Slick Rick, I mean all these different concepts can really stand out and just hold songs together. Um, but this was, was, this was a new concept that, you know, held together perfectly and, and really stood out. And to hear him, you know, to hear, hear, hear him saying it over the phone, it was, it was like, you know, I could tell it was, you know, he needed to get that on, on, on that. He needed to record that, so. All of those things that he wanted to exercise, he could do through Slim Shady. And I don't think it was necessarily a diversionary tactic. I think it just gave him total freedom. And, you know, the last record was a Slim Shady LP. This one's going to be the Marshall Mathers LP. I think that in and of itself demonstrates that he doesn't need Slim Shady. It was just another avenue to uh, demonstrate. Got rap records in W.A. and Ice-T and Too Short back when I was 11, 12, Two Live Crew, you know what I'm saying? And I wasn't going out and raping girls and, you know what I'm saying? And it's, it's you you know it, you listen to the shit and it's like, it's, it's, it's funny to you. Do you know what I'm saying? It was, those records were funny to me or they were, they were cool to, to, to listen to, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> What's up, Shady? All right, man, this is Black Knight coming out to you live. <laughs> this what? world's so fucked up, I don't understand. That's why I blaze up with Reckless, my main man. Even he's lost there in the mong. It was probably that fucking coke ball the bong. It's a lot better when you walk the streets. Belly starts rumbling, needs something to eat. When I get the munch, start eating like a dog, then flex it on the couch like a fucking log, log. Oh my God, I'm seeing double T-R-O-U, t, -t, -t, t trouble In my own world, now nah, eyes look beady. Thinking about Mariah Carey in a pink bikini. Seeing little black dots in the sky. Yes, I'm red, yes, I'm red, yes, I'm fucking high. Today's hit music, 93.1 DRQ. It's Lisa Lisa and party people you've been asking for. It. Here it is, the latest from Eminem. It's the real Slim Shady at DRQ. Um, because I always hear it. When I ever think of Dr. Dre or um, I hear that name, I think of NWA because I'm from back way old school. And so I expect more of what Snoop brings to a song than Eminem. But yet a lot of the, I think the reality is I think where Dr. Dre keeps him from being too silly so that it's almost unbelievable. I think that edge of reality, that, you know, that sharp little edge that Eminem has, I think that's a little bit of Dr. Dre saying, hey man, keep it real. I'd have to say Dr. Dre is more influenced by him. Everything I've been hearing lately that uh, Dr. Dre's been doing, even on his album, uh, it sounds to me like Marshall wrote the songs because Dre never rapped that fast before. Dre was always slow and, uh, you know, not dissing Dr. Dre. I think he's, you know, the ultimate, but um, it just sounds like uh, Marshall's doing all the writing for him right now. Because even on his records, it just sounds like they're Marshall's records. There was one song he did, um, I think it was on the last album. I, I, get, I get confused a lot of times with his album that actually came out and what I remember him doing when he was in the studio. But there was one story and it was talking about role models. And it was talking about how young people shouldn't really look to rappers, athletes, whatever he was referring to as role models. Because look, at we're out doing A, B, C, D. Oh, hey, I'm a role model. 
And I thought it was funny at the time, but again, he's got a real true message, and I think the message really stands, especially in that genre of music, because so many young urban kids, I don't care what color you are, look to these rappers, and if all the rappers talking about is gun, you know, gang banging and guns and calling all girls hoes, and, and kids are emulating these guys as role models, what Eminem is basically saying is, are you crazy? You're making, that your, you're making me your role model? You know what I do? I go out and I get loaded. I go out and I get high. I don't have a girlfriend. <laughs> Everybody know he's a man on me shot. He gonna roll in the wrist and I catch a me with a me and the next man. He... KG. <laughs> <laughs> with the girl who blind. With the people behind us, we come from Zimbabwe, the H-Town. H-Town. gonna bounce, <laughs> we mess around. You grab a dagger, you stagger. Backstab another rap. Who's my styles? The Simba on the rap attack. Simba attack that's on the Peter Pan scam. Do this rhyme alive. I said, yes, I'm the man. I'm so fly that I took ya to the Bristol town. Never be knowing what I said. And yes, you know, I smoked ya. Oh, Africa. Yeah, um, can you believe the slickness? I'm doing a rhyme so deep that even your shovel couldn't dig this. Oh. I'm screaming, ah, because M and M will excite you. He slice you and he dice you. Leave you dangling like a bosom. Because he is breaking psycho. He brings the mad chaos when you drop it off. And it's Simba on the man from the underground. No doubt, each time yeah, representative. <laughs> What's up, Shady? Get us in. We're on the guest list. Where we at? <laughs> we got Shady B right here from all the way from California, man, for this show. Dr. Dre's first show ever in the UK. My first day in the UK. Give me a moment of occasion. We're going to burn it down. We love Eminem. And we love Dr. Dre. Dr. Dre, woo! Dr. Dre, <laughs> His brother's cute, Dr. Dre. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Dr. Dre's brother. Yeah! Dr. Dre on TV. Oh, but I love Dr. Dre. Yeah. 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 I hope so. Looking for a ticket, man. Hoping not to pay too many quid, man. We're hoping for a ticket. Get us in that video. Come on. Come on, Shady. Get us in the door, man. Come on. What's up? And growing up as a white kid in the States, everybody had the NWA album. He just, it was a had to have. Like uh, Public Enemy's first album. Everybody had it. Everybody knew every word to it. And I think it uh, made a serious difference in the perception of black and white in America. And it's good to see it still going on. As soon as Eminem is selling all these records, everyone's going on about he's white. Yet when he was underground and he was just a good MC, no one ever said, hey, wait, wait a minute, you're white. No one said that. He was just an amazing MC. The white rap, you know, I, 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 there was an interesting thing when I interviewed Chuck D, who's the, the main guy of Public Enemy, right? He said that he wanted to sign Vanilla Rice before a Vanilla Rice was signed. That's what Chuck D said to me, right? He wanted to be able to own him because he knew that Vanilla Rice would sell millions. He knew this. It was just all media marketing and promotion that made those people big and it wasn't about what they were doing, it wasn't about what they were rapping about, it wasn't about anything. The whole mentality of hip-hop has changed now, so it's now open to people like Kid Rock and especially Eminem to come up because Eminem comes from a background which is very, um, uh, is critically acclaimed anyway. He comes from Dr. Dre's stable. And Dr. Dre's like could be the best hip hop producer in the world. Eminem. West side till we both die, Eminem. Love, peace. Yeah. <laughs> Are you gay? Fuck you, Eminem. Fuck, Fuck you. you. Yeah, man. You know Eminem is good, yeah. But you know what? Yeah, I think that in a couple of years we'll be doing shows in Detroit, yeah. And Eminem is going to be in the queue, like waiting to see us. So wait, when he sees this, I'm waiting to remember me, yeah? So, yo, I'm causing casualties to mentalities and anatomies And that's the reason why your faculty don't want to rap with me Apparently my family can't even handle me My mother phoned me and told me that she wanted to strangle me I'm living savagely, but I want to be living lavishly If my dreams come true, I'll ask my girl to marry me Attacking rapidly with a pinch of assault and battery No one's as fat as me, so nobody can carry me Best know I'm so cold, I freeze your whole soul My rhymes is so dark, they leave fingerprints on cold One hand grips the mic while the other crushes and glow You're lacking in lyrics, delivery and breath control When fake MCs see me, you know they start running, I wear camouflage condoms so they can't see me coming. Wanna ride the rhythm, so hit them with daily venom. And when I'm in them, I'm wetting up your yeti like I'm jizzing. Don't make me have to grab your egghead and boil it, cause I take the piss like I'm running off with your toilet. Yeah. Hell yeah, man. 
I just when I busted out the thick Rick a hick dick rocked on the waterbed so hard she got seasick. I'm always out looking for the Asian tail. I wanna drive my rickshaw up your Ho Chi Minh trail. Detroit, man, Detroit City, Detroit Michigan. That's right, Detroit Rock City. You going in? The home of white boy rap. Home of the Wiggers. St. Clair Shores is uh, Marshall's stomping grounds. This is where he came from. This is where he will always come back to. Um, his friends are around here. His family is around here. His daughter is around this area. Uh, Gilbert's is around this area. Gilbert means quite a bit to him. Uh, Marshall, of course, as everybody knows, um, was here for quite a while on and off. And Marshall, I don't think we'll ever forget this place. I think he'll always come back and visit it. And when he walks in, he's just an average Joe. He acts, I mean, tries to get away from some of those screaming girls that recognize him. But uh, still, he sits down and just chills out and talks with everybody just like we're old times. It almost seems like he never left. Him walking in with his baggy pants. Exactly. <laughs> Hanging down to his knees. Yep. And his little strut, his shaved head. He used to have a shaved head. Him telling me to shut up. <laughs> Probably <laughs> when I'd yell orders to him. I don't know if him always saying he's going to do it and just laughing at him and just his face. I mean, he was hurt. He believed in himself and he knew he was going to do it and he did. My first hookup with Eminem was uh, he called the magazine um, inquiring about uh, uh, getting some, some press coverage on him as an artist. and. Uh, I remember he asked me about advertising and such, and we we talked, we, we hit it off pretty good. I was uh, I was certain that uh, I was speaking with a black guy on the other end, which is uh, usually I, I can I can tell, but this guy was certain, you know, he was definitely from the hood, you know. And uh, after that, um, met him at a at a little uh, little showcase on Seven Mile called Ebony Showcase. Um, he was, you know, he was performing with his partner IQ and uh, just did a couple of songs off of the Infinite album. And, uh, you know, he, he walked up to me and said, um, uh, you're Mark Kemp from Underground Sounds. Um, and d did you get the Eminem project? Did you get the Eminem album? I was like, nope. I talked to him one time on the phone, but uh, is he here? And Eminem, of course, said, well, that's me. So um, after that, we kind of seen each other at a few concerts. Uh, he asked me to do some favors uh, with my connections through the Underground Sounds to set him up with um, some appointments in New York, some A&R appointments. I set him up with three or four or five appointments in New York, um, and they went real good. Um, he and uh, his partner, Bazaar, were both, you know, kind of set up collectively. and. Uh, and they were showing a lot of interest in Eminem, but it was nothing, nothing major yet. You know, nobody like, nobody like jumped out of their shoes like eventually they realized they should have. At some point after a couple of those interviews, he asked me to be his manager. He called me up one day um, and said, you know, I need you to keep, uh, you know, plugging away for me. I want you to be my manager and, uh, and set up some more appointments and, you know, help me promote. And, all that. School was not for him. No. <laughs> no. Not at all. No. He was never into it and never had any desire to pursue it. He, did, he didn't like other people telling him no. Right. He figured that was his decision. Um, as far as his situation with his mother, um, not good. She was, she called her quite a bit and bothered him quite a bit, but uh, he just, he seemed to get over it and deal with his everyday duties and all of his spare time and his spare money was um, just for the music business. He lived and breathed it and he knew he was going to be a star. He told us, I'd say go back to school. I said that rap is great and all, but go back to school. Marshall wouldn't listen. Marshall wanted to be a superstar and I'm really proud to say that he is. <laughs>
people seem to concentrate more on the subject matter that I'm rapping about than realizing, hey, this guy's putting words together that's, that's, that nobody else puts together. This guy's making things rhyme. Nobody really sees the talent, I don't think. Not many people, especially reporters and, and, and journalists, they always concentrate on the negativity and the cuss words and this and that, you know what I'm saying? And never stop to think what it takes to actually put, what it, what it actually takes to, to put that shit in my music. I'd have to say Eminem right now is the big great white hope. But back then, if you weren't from New York or Los Angeles, you know, you just didn't make it. Yeah, if you were black and you had some talent, you might make it. But if you were white, no way. Wasn't a chance. Yeah, he would come in and he'd be like, okay, um, why do you got a Kid Rock shirt on? I'm like, well, I support local hip hop and rap and, you know, in the industry and I, and I know him. And he goes, well, he sucks, and there's a lot of other people out there you should be liking, you know. And I'm like, okay, you know, you're putting everybody down, but what do you got? Let me hear what you got. And uh, he'd come in from time to time and you know, hand me some of his tapes. Uh, first thing he was in, involved in was something called Basement Productions. And um, he was a thousand miles a minute. You couldn't even understand what he was saying. He was going at it so fast. But each time he'd come in with something a little, little different, a little better, you know, a little better sounding. And I'm like, you know, if this guy could just put it down a little clear, you know, he might do something. Oh, this is uh, oh, six, seven years ago. And he just bust out a rap in the middle of the store. And everybody would be shopping and he'd be helping people. And all of a sudden, everybody would turn around and look at this guy and say, who's this asshole? You know, this guy, what's he think he is, you know? Oh, that's Eminem. Uh, who? I'm like, Eminem. I'm like, okay. Yeah, he's just some asshole. He ain't got nothing to do, you know. Ain't going to make it. But um, and then uh, one time we had this uh, in-store with Kid Rock in Isham, and uh, Marshall showed up for that and challenged him verbally to a rap. And Kid Rock said, uh, this is my time, but your time will come. And uh, he told him to just to enunciate and um, you know, make, make yourself more clear, and uh, maybe something will happen. And uh, nobody ever thought of anything then, but um, eventually it did. No doubts about it, Eminem is far, far better than Kid Rock when it comes to lyrics and delivery and style and flow and creativity. He's just 10 times better than Kid Rock on those types of things. The really great thing about um, Eminem and Kid Rock is the fact that they're really down for the, for the home school. You know, it's like, they're down with the team, and, and they're bringing a lot of these people along with them. And they're getting them signed, and they're putting them on their own labels. You know, D12's record, they're working on that one right now. And, um, you know, of course, Kid's got Cracker's record coming out. And, you know, it, it's like they it means something to them to be able to help promote the other artists in this town. You know, so he has people from Detroit there. I just finally caught his new video, you know, Proof is in there. I mean, Prue's been around, you know, doing different things. But in terms of representing, making it clear, you know, I am from Detroit, instead of pulling people in, you know, trying to get his label started and signing Detroit artists, like, you know, that not only that I make it, and I'm going to be, go beyond just having you in my video, giving you a shout out in my CD case. Like, no, I'm actually going to try to get you guys signed or try to get you guys out here as well, get you some distribution, some publicity. That definitely helps. 
Lotus K9 representing Shadow Cabinet. Out here is hectic, crazy. I'm not even joining the queue. I'm getting in though, you know. Gotta hold it down. Now. I respect Eminem. That's right. You know? That's right here. That's right, man. This is the 18th Angel. We've got the Shadow Cabinet. Eminem concert. I don't know what else to say. Ain't gonna freestyle, but he is. How many slingers do you know they get fucked? What? How many slingers scream out loud? What the blood clock? Take out 85 with one shot for my full clock. Oh, I'm a piss and lyrical missile ripping through your brain tissue. Mama miss you, sister on the street, selling big issue. Your mind is gone. Couldn't handle the pain like a lethal injection coming straight to your brain. Detroit has a long legacy of being a big music town, and, and now we're seeing that it's that hasn't gone away. It's just getting bigger and more intense, and once again, the spotlight shining on us. This is this is like a prime example of the material that I play. It's, uh, the debut release on my label, House Shoes Recordings, Fat Cat, dedication to the suckers. He's a Slum Village affiliate and uh, produced by JD, who's responsible for like some of the, the, the nastiest shit to come out in the last few years. Just truthfully, Fat Cat, you come to a Fat Cat show, just expect to see raw energy, you know, just truth. True hip hop in its rawest form. Yeah, Detroit is full of energy, but it's like the ratio is just so, so jacked up. It's like 80% whack. You know, it's 80% whack MCs in Detroit, and it's, you got that 20% that's, you know, that's really trying to do their thing. And but you know, by being so many garbage people here, that's who get to shine. You know, it's all good though. It's all good. I love my city. See, the way it was here at the hip hop shop, we had open mic on Saturday afternoon, and M was real cool with proof, so it wasn't really like. I don't know if it's really like a, a white thing as far as Detroit is concerned. I know a lot of places it's like that. It's just the, the fact of being an unfamiliar face. You know what I'm saying? If cats don't know who you are and you're up in their area, you know, rocking their shit, they're gonna be like, who is this cat? Who, who's he think he is coming in here on our turf? You know what I'm saying? But I mean, I've gone through the same thing. Cats see me at the club and they're like, you know, what's this? This cat should be spinning some old rock and roll shit. You know what I'm saying? Ah oh, man, I got, I got everybody whipped on the hip hop in Detroit, man. I got them turned out. Whenever, whenever there's some new stuff out, cats are coming to St. Andrews on Friday to hear it, you know. But when when M when M got his shine, it was just an, that's just another marketing tool for him, you know. There's no white kids out there. Personally, me being a DJ, and I come across a lot of music. 95 to 98 percent of white rappers just, it's not, it's some rock shit. You know, I like hip hop. I don't listen to Limp Biscuit. I don't listen to Corn. I don't listen to none of that shit. M just, he's a monster, just period. Black or white, I mean, he's just, no one's really touching him on, 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 on his mic skills, man. He's just getting in everybody's ass. I like hard ass, hard ass hip hop, but I like it pretty at the same time. I like it melodic, you know, musical. Not just some, not some old Swiss beats shit. I don't want to hear Swiss beats keyboard, every track sound the same. I want to be able to hear it go through your whole album and, and you're just running the gamut on, on the musical tip, you know? Keep, keep it somebody, you got to keep somebody interested musically as well as lyrically, you know? Because cats can't rhyme without the tracks, but then again, you can just find anybody to rhyme on top of. You got to have somebody who counts. And like, the venues here, they quick to pay, you know, someone from out of town to come do a show when, you know, the talent here is just as good, and they want us to do the stuff for free, so really I don't even get into the, into the, you know, into the scene, the music scene or whatever here. I'm just, just being in the lab, doing my thing like that. Getting love from everywhere else. Detroit, you know, they really don't support their hometown. They really don't support, they quick to support people from other cities, and they catch on to their home last. M had that hunger, and he knew that right after the bat, when he, when he put his EP out, and he had, his EP was ridiculous. He put it out, and all the little underground cats was loving it, but he wasn't getting any love from the radio stations. The record stores was telling him they was pushing his product, but he'd go in there and he'd be sitting under the counter, you know? 
He snatched his stuff out of all the stores in Detroit and just took it on the road. Went out to Las Vegas, California, New York, and they were blowing his product out as soon as he got it to him. So he got the buzz going on the underground, and then we all know Dre heard him rhyming on the radio one day, snatched him up, and the rest is history. When the Slim Shady EP came out, we did like this listening party, and no one came. I mean, zero. I said, and like I said, when they're giving out those free, those free tapes, I'm giving out his tapes for free. And people were like, nah, I don't want, I'd rather not have this tape. So now he's blowing up, people calling me, emailing, trying to get dubs. I mean, literally a few months later, if he got signed to Dre, people would love him, and oh, we want to do all this stuff, and this thing, and damn, you guys didn't show him any love, you know, just a few months ago, so. You know, that was really it. That was just one of the, you know, down-to-earth guys, so. <laughs> Incredibly, he doesn't see her, and she has no chance of avoiding him. Sometimes I, I, I like saying shit just to, just to get under people's skin a little bit, you know what I'm saying? Make them pay more attention to me and, and, and make them, you know, uh, pay attention to what their kids are listening to, do you know what I'm saying? I, you know, I, I come right out and say, like, I'm, my music is not for children. It's not, it's not really for kids. Not to say the kids won't get it. Do you know what I'm saying? Though when he first, when he first got his first CD out, the one that no one's even seen, I mean, it was one that he made up himself right. and he had named like himself Eminem. <laughs> yeah, he made it like in his basement and he gave us all a copy, but we were like, wow, this I is going to go somewhere. <laughs> this is going to go somewhere. In fact, I didn't even know about some of the songs he had and then people would come up to me and tell me about them and I'd be like oh my god I used to work with him I, <laughs> I've known him he used to hang out with us after work sometimes he never drink we'd always have to beg him to go drinking no because he was too busy he had yeah. stuff to do yeah. he had stuff to get together he's working on so rap. he could be a star The very first full-time job I got on air was at a station called WHYT, 96.3 Jams here in Detroit. And it was a hip-hop top 40 station. And I was doing nights then, which was 10 p.m. to 2 in the morning. So I had a lot more freedom than I do now. And one of the features I had on a regular basis was a thing I called open mic night. And what we would do is we would set up a live DJ in the studio with two turntables to mix. And they'd basically just kick beats for like an hour and I'd invite the local up-and-coming rappers that weren't signed to labels, that didn't have any records in stores, down to the studio to rap live to this DJ. And we had about 12 rappers back in the day, um, three women and the rest nine or so guys. And Eminem was one of my regulars that would come down. Um, they all had to audition. And what they would do to audition basically is call the request line, say, I want to be on open mic night. And they'd have to be persistent. So they had to call a lot because the first time you're always going to be like, oh, no, you blow, you know, I'm not going to put you on. And they had to basically rap freestyle for me on the telephone. So you have to impress somebody without any kind of visual, um, just with your lyrical, you know, expertise. And so after about two or three phone calls, we brought him down. And he came with a whole group of guys. It wasn't just him. He came down with, um, I think his group was called Basement Productions back in the day. There was a guy named uh, DJ Butterfingers that was with him. Um, Vance Parrish, uh, Mannix was another one that was one of his writers and producers. One of the first couple of raps he did, I don't even remember, I think it was that he was locked in a psycho ward or something, but it was, it was almost like a joke, it was like a comedy, but then you listen to it and it had such a dark undertone. Um, but his style was very off the cuff, he wasn't so concerned about rhyming words and keeping beats, he was more interested in I think telling his story and almost making you laugh but then after you think about it, you wondered why you laughed. So, I mean, he was, he was, he was a standout back in the day, but it was kind of like, what is wrong with this guy? He's not following your traditional, you know, road to becoming a rapper, so. We booked him for this show up at U of M. It was him, Royce to 5'9", Almighty Dreadnoughts, there's a whole bunch of Detroit folks. And M was headlined. This is after, I think he'd been in the source and uh, Rap Olympics. And so he was starting to get, before he got signed, 
But I remember the next day he had to do a show in New York, and he kept calling. But, he, and he had, but the thing is, he ended up not making it because he was tied up in the studio, which, you know, people were disappointed. But the thing that he called three or four times that night, just in case I'm trying to come, I'm going to make it, you know, can I still come? About maybe an hour before the show, before, about an hour before the place closed up, he was like, you know, I'm done. You know, I can rush down there and try to do five, you know, a song. And I was just like, you know, well, he was in the you know, east side or whatever. By the time he got out to Ann Arbor, it wouldn't have been worth his drive. But the fact that he kept calling, and then later that week, um, I don't know how much did this and how much the manager had to play in this, but called just like to apologize. And I'm really sorry I couldn't make this show. You know, I owe you one. I mean, now I don't expect it. I mean, whatever. But, but just that gesture, though. I mean, that, that was a very important thing. That's something that said to me because most guys won't do it. They just don't show up. And then they get an attitude with you. And he was just like, you know, I'm, you know I wish I could have made it, you know, or whatever. So that stood out to me. And he used to go by um, Eminem, the letters M and M, and all the other rappers in the room were teasing him and joking him because it was M&M's, oh, melting your mouth, not in your hand, and trying to get sexually, you know, dogging him out sexually and all this. And um, we had a thing called uh, an open mic night challenge where I had three or four of them, and the DJ just kept kicking the beats, and they jumped on the mic until I timed them and said, okay, next, next. And whoever either cussed first or couldn't keep the beat first was off. Well, he kept... When he jumped on the mic, he turned all of that anger that he felt in the room, teasing him, into a, a strength, and he ended up winning. And his whole rap that night was about how Eminem ain't what they're trying to say it was, that it has nothing to do with his sexual potency or chocolate-covered candies or anything like that. And I just remember sitting there watching this little blonde white kid, like, what are you doing? How are you turning this around on these guys? I think I break a lot of rules. I think I say a lot of shit that I'm not supposed to say, or people think I'm not supposed to say. I don't care what I'm supposed to say and what I'm not supposed to say. And because uh, he's been working hard a long time, he he would record his music. He uh, would go out and play, use that uh, material with his audience, get their reaction, and and he was doing great. He would go to uh, some theaters here in town, and he would sell out. You know, doing his own promotion and which was, uh, it was, it was really good. Jamais la patience n'a connu le jour pour un passé amer. Les gens s'enterrent sans avoir vu la lumière du jour dans le futur. Enfant égaré à la richesse de la paix n'a jamais connu de gaieté, blood. Métamorphosé par le malheur, parle de lumière dans sa filière, toujours en prière. Yeah. I work with a lot of different artists. I mean, right now I'm working with about, about 10 different artists. Sun, Paradigm, Telepath Math, Artful Dodgers, B-Movie Fiends, um, Erratic Static, uh, Thoughtful, The Disregarded, um, some of those. Are, and uh, some of the things I do for artists are um, make sure stores get their music, make sure the music looks good. Um, yeah, an Eminem fan would be interested in this, this record uh, um, to pick up the, uh, the song called Trite Thieves. Uh, it was Eminem, Bizarre, and Fuzz kind of passing off the mic to each other. Real, real tight track. DJ Head did, did a, a blazing track. Stuff still gets played in Detroit all over the place. Um, that's what I was doing for Eminem at the time. Um, we put together uh, posters, the album cover I put together for the Slim Shady EP, um, photography. We did a lot of uh, photography that was real eye-catching. Um, I do all of that. Um, I was uh, distributing his music to stores, um, setting up interviews for um, uh, Metro Times, Real Detroit type of type of um, type of magazines and, and newspapers in the area, um, booking shows. A couple times uh, I threw shows specifically, you know, to have him headline and and promote him that way. Um, and uh, booked him on some shows like uh, the Hieroglyphics, did a show in Detroit, uh, Razcast did a show in Detroit, and got him as an opener act for some of these national talent that came in. Um, uh, I took him down to the Scribble Jam, which was uh, one of his big, big uh, starts outside of Detroit. And the Scribble Jam happens in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, put on by uh, this guy named G and this guy named uh, Mr. Dibbs, who's a legendary DJ, and um, I was uh, I was real in tune with um, 
the what was going on in the internet and the chat rooms and the news groups and everything and uh, strongly promoting Eminem that way too and uh, and uh, I started to see this response now that um, people in Cincinnati and people from Cleveland and people from Louisville and people from Tallahassee and people from you know all these cities o all over the country got a little taste of him and and uh, the buzz started to grow so heavily and uh, started to see the feedback and, and everything on the internet and uh, it was real strong just just from that little uh, little appearance there then uh, from that he got invited to be uh, in uh, the Rap Olympics that was uh, to take place at Rap Sheet in uh, LA the Rap Sheet annual uh, conference and uh, so I flew out there with him and uh, again he came in second against uh, you know some signed acts some a lot of people that you know you might know um, came in second in that and that you know furthered his uh, furthered his approach and uh, at that point um, I met a met a, a guy low on the totem pole at Interscope gave him a copy of the Eminem tape um, which I hear, heard later that that was the actual tape that, um, that Dr. Dre picked up off the floor and said Oh, this is a cool looking album cover, you know, who, what's this guy about? And uh, so that's, to my knowledge, uh, you know, some of the bigger steps in, uh, in, in his career building. All of a sudden, uh, Dr. Dre happens to uh, get one of his little demo tapes that he did and um, likes it and flies him out there. And in the process of this, he had this little uh, thing uh, when he changed his little um, image to Slim Shady and his little EP, and there's like, five or six songs on there and uh, I guess Dr. Dre heard that and liked what he heard. I care what my daughter thinks about me, you know what I'm saying, and what my girl thinks about me back home and my little brother. That's who I care, my immediate family, not, you know what I'm saying, everybody else, you, not no offense, you know what I'm saying. See, I'll tell you this, this is the story that I tell everybody. When he first came back from Cali, from doing uh, My Name Is. <clears throat> Man, he was playing that song for Cats and they was losing their minds. They were going, I remember he played it for me after the club one night. He was like, come here. He had just got a new, a new used car. I know he, he got a few cars now probably, but this is when he had first got some money off of it. And Cats were losing their minds, but then when the video came out, everybody started hating on him. And I'm like, man, it's just a marketing tool. You can't hate him for what they making him do. Because once you're under contract to the, to the majors, man, you, you're a pawn in the game. You got to do whatever the hell they want you to do. So I'm making uh, the video for Kid Rock and Isham debut on MTV. And it was just phenomenal just seeing these guys doing videos, down to earth, just people that I sat around, shot the shit with, partied with. And now they're like these big superstars. I would say he might have lost a couple, a couple listeners when he, uh, you know, when he, uh, dyed his hair blonde and jumped on MTV. But um, uh, I think the, the people who, um, who pulled back from him because of, uh, because of a nice looking video on MTV are really missing out on a lot of stuff, so. He wants to get rid of this pop image that he's got just because he wins all the awards. Oh, he's this cute little white boy with you know, blue eyes and you know, blonde hair, bleach blonde hair. And um, they're putting him in this pop category with the Backstreet Boys and Christina Aguilera and Britney Spears and all that, and he's definitely not any of that. And I think once the uh, public gets a hold of this and the lawyers uh, find out about all this stuff, uh, he's definitely not going to be their cute little boy anymore. He's going to distinguish himself away from this crowd. The, 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 best, the best rhyme I done heard from M is this joint off his new album called Stan. I don't know if you heard about it. It's like. The first three verses are like letters from like this obsessive fan and each one gets like progressively like more demented like the cat's losing his mind. The first verse he's like, hey, I'm your, I'm your best fan. You know, I'm just calling to tell you, I want to write, write you this letter and tell you. Second verse is like he gets into some of the problems in his personal life and like, why ain't you wrote me back? You know, I'm your biggest fan, why ain't you wrote me back? The third verse, he's like driving down the street, he's got his wife and baby in the trunk and he's just lost it. Like, I put my life into you. I, I just supported you from the beginning and you haven't showed me any love. And at the end of the third verse, my man like drives off a cliff or some shit. 
The fourth verse is M finally responding to my man, but he just drove his shit off a cliff. He's like, you know, I'm sorry it took me so long to get back at you, you know, but I've been real busy, but my man's already gone. That was a wild song. That was, that's the one that everyone's talking about at the new album that I've heard for the most part. Before I even heard it, it was my most requested record here at the station. I think just from the video alone. Um, I just started playing it. I do the mix show also here at the station, and I just started playing it last Saturday night. And um, I find it especially ironic because the core artists we play here at DRQ are Christina Aguilera, Britney Spears, Backstreet Boys, and Sing, and that's who he slays in the song. Um, but I think he's got a very valid point, is that you can sit there and be cookie cutter bands with some producer handing you songs where you're not really thinking, you're basically brain dead as an artist. The choreographer's teaching you how to dance, they're teaching you how to sing, this person's telling you what to sing. Whereas he and a lot of artists like him are doing all the creation. I mean, Kid Rock plays how many instruments? You know what I'm saying? He writes his material. So I think, I think it's, again, it's a funny story if you look on the surface, but underneath, I think he's got a real good point. I think his last one, the new CD that came out, is just fa it's fabulous. Yeah. He's been he's been made fun of by all these people and wannabes, people who want to be right, Slim Shady. And this last one's the best one. It says, "Stand up, the real, the real Slim Shady, stand up." And uh, he's the real Slim Shady. From a Caucasian guy, um, rap always seemed to me to be such a closed group. You know, you had to be African American, you had to be talking about guns, you had to be talking about drugs and pimping girls and this kind of thing. And uh, so for him, a Caucasian guy from Detroit, to be talking all this silly stuff and all this nonsense, um, it was shocking. But it wasn't because I know how persistent he was. I know how dedicated he was and how much he believed in himself and how much he wanted it. So yeah, I was shocked that I think more that the record label picked him up, that Dr. Dre found an interest in him and that the public liked him. But I wasn't shocked that he took it as far as he did. I knew he was going to be a star. There was, there was no doubt in my mind that that, that that boy that worked here as a fry cook at Gilbert's was going to be a superstar someday. And we all knew it. And we were very proud of him here.